Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Birds and Stars podcast, third season. All my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. It's an amazing episode because Frederick Weedman boards the mothership to discuss Batman Cape Crusader. Now, come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Weedman. Thank you so much for coming to the Birds and Stars podcast. Thank you so much for having me again. So, my pleasure. I always like having um, a great guest come back, so thank you so much. So, um, you're now the comp- last time we spoke, you were the composer for Star Trek Picard. Uh, now you're doing Batman Cape Crusader on Amazon Prime. So how do you get involved with that project? Um, you know, my history with DC stuff and animation Warner Brothers goes back to 2011 when I got my first show with them, Green Lantern, the animated series, which was mm. also a Bruce Tim show. So, you know, that's that's how far back it goes. And I think from that point on, I've done like 14 DC movies. Uh, I did another Batman show called Beware the Batman. So I've always been sort of in the rotation of composers for for Warner Brothers animation over the years. So, you know, when this project came along, I was lucky enough to be one of them, one of the composers that they considered to audition for it. And I did. And while they presented a rather complex, difficult and unusual concept of the music, I, I, you know, did the best I could and thankfully won the job. So, yeah, it's always a sign of quality when they ask you to come back. You know, uh, yes. <laughs> it's yes, like to get a job, but it's nothing to be asked to come back from the people who you worked with before. I agree. You know, it's uh, sometimes you just get the call. Hey, I'm doing a new show and you're you're it, which is the nicest because you're like, great, <laughs> I don't have to do anything. <laughs> but there's, you know, Warner Brothers, they have a protocol just like most studios where they ask a handful of composers, usually handpicked by the people that are in charge. And then we basically battle each other out <laughs> over the course of a few weeks. So, That's the normal so what was their pitch to you about what they expected from the music? Because Batman Cape Crusader, for those who don't know or are not familiar with it, it's sort of like Batman the Main series, but like darker, more adult. Um, and definitely, I think, um, stylistically far more um, 40s and 50s than 90s. So yeah. what's their pitch to you? It's exactly that. I mean... When I, I, they sent me a scene first to score, which they sent to all these other composers as well. And, you know, the big direction was we want to push this as far as we can into the 1940s territory. You know, the, the, the visuals are so, uh, they're so specifically art deco, all of the designs in Gotham, the, the stuff people are wearing in the cars, it's, it's, it's absolutely set in that time period. Um, and so they wanted the music to reflect that, which is, it sounds like a simple task because you're like, all right, this is the music from that era. Let's just do that. But it turned out to be a lot more challenging than I had initially thought, primarily for two reasons. Um, there, there isn't a whole lot of superhero material in that time period that you can look look at, mm. you know, specifically and say, oh, let's look at the Batman from 1940s, the movie, which doesn't really exist. Mm. So it's it's a trickier thing to reference because you're like okay we're 1940s i get it you know max steiner Korngold, all those composers but none of it sounds like batman so how do you take that and then sort of package that into what they're trying to do while staying true to the fact that we're dealing with a you know with such an iconic character that people know so well and have heard so many themes played with over the over decades that, and still somehow figure out a way to keep the core of the score to sound like a movie from the 1940s. So that was a quite the challenge for me to and then not to crack. Um, and I found that the most tangible thing for me to hold on to stylistically was music from Bernard Herrmann from the early Bernard Herrmann movies from the 40s, like Citizen Kane, okay. Hangover Square, and those kind of things. I'm not talking Psycho and those later ones. And so I was listening to a lot of that and really getting under the hood of the orchestration, the use of melody and uh, the colors he used in the music that just give it that feel that, okay, we're in that time period now. Mm. And so I took those ideas and the tone of that and I tried to figure out a way, how do we now wrap this into a Batman material where he is not necessarily um, a superhero yet. And this is the second biggest um, point that they gave me, the creative Bruce Tim and James Tucker, 
and the other producers from the beginning they didn't want batman to be a superhero yet so they didn't want to introduce him with a big rousing theme that mm. you know is reminiscent of Danny Altman or even Hans Zimmer for you know for comparison but really more um dark investigative a little ominous almost like the idea was that Batman isn't really a hero yet he's just starting out he's very obscure he's lurking in the shadows the people in Gotham aren't happy to see him they're more afraid of him they're like who is this guy keep popping out killing people and you know yanking people up on slingshots and over train train tracks and things like this <laughs> so I, th that was kind of the idea like how do we make him a little bit more menacing in the beginning and then as he is creating his liaisons and and finding his partners in crime along the way it becomes a little bit more into the superhero territory but before then it's really just uh mysterious and that was sort of the combination of all that that we decided is going to be the sound of our show i think that's fascinating i, I like the the mention of the composers from um as you're saying, the the like Citizen Kane, uh, things of that nature. For people of the, like my generation, that's a pretty deep cut. You're going back quite a bit to find them. And when I was listening to the sound, I don't know, I kind of had a thought in my head of those 40 serials, kind of like you know, um, it, it is a it's a fascinating look back at the older um, scores of, of the day. Yeah, day. and it was so much fun because you know, like back then. If you look at these really old movies, they're absolutely fantastic. And, you know, they have set so much in motion in film aesthetics that we still look back to for reference. I think they're so beautiful and groundbreaking in their own unique way. But the way they're scored often is something you wouldn't really do today in that exact way. Like if you if you score things that get how they did it back then, it would almost feel comical today or over the top. You know, like I always re refer to this, uh, the famous like dun 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 that we say when we have conversations. Like that's what they did back then to introduce the big monster entrance. It was totally acceptable. People were like, oh, here we carry come the trombones and the timpani. <laughs> and there comes the, that bad, the bad guy or the big monster. But if you do it today, you wouldn't really be taken seriously for that mm. by the audience. So I, that was the other fine line I had to walk is how to maintain that old scoring sound, but at, at the same time do it modern enough that we're still dark and scary and more adult and that people take us seriously as a show and not laugh at it you know yeah. and that, that that's a challenging thing because it's so easy to fall into this trap to overdo it and then people go like oh, okay that was a little silly you know and you, we didn't want that we wanted it we wanted our show to be very serious and and much much darker than btas was and th as you mentioned with batman there's some giants in the world of composing who have worked on batman like you said Danny oh, yeah. Elfman. Did the classic Batman 89, um, yeah. the Batman anime series, that theme is so classic. Hans Zimmer yeah. has made his mark on yeah. Batman. Um, even though they're outside what you were thinking about, is it hard to completely forget about their scores when doing a Batman show? I don't think anybody can. I mean, it's like, it's almost as iconic. I think the Elfman's the Batman theme is, is almost as influential or iconic like Jaws. You know, if you think about Batman, just talking about somebody, hey, did you see that Batman like that? I don't think anybody comes hums another tune but that one from mm. from you know Benny Elfman. It's just so tied to that character, probably more than anything. Um, but I think that the reason why Batman has been so successful over decades now is because he's a he's a character that can constantly be slightly reinvented by whoever is taking care of it. You know. It, and that's what becomes interesting to me because you, every interpretation of of, that, of Batman that has so, so far occurred, I have fallen in love with. It doesn't matter who did it, but it's every time it's like, wow, that's that's a neat take on that. I dig it, and I'm into it. Like the, the Christopher Nolan series was nothing like the um, the Danny Elfman, you know, '80s Batman's at all. But it was so freaking good that I was just sucked into this completely different world, and I totally accepted that this is also Batman. I never once questioned it. And the same goes for the, the TV shows too. I think Batman the Animated Series is, you know, it should always receive its its spot on the pedestal as the number one Batman show in cartoons ever created and probably will always be, and, and rightfully so. But it doesn't mean that we can't take 
take that and sort of take it into a different direction while still somewhat train, staying true to the tone of that that people really seem to love still today and that's what we were basically trying to do and it's, it's a hard thing to do and you know like with star trek that we talked about a year ago yeah you, do, doing the doing this a, a good service to the fans is probably one of the most intimidating and daunting things is probably less for me as a composer than for somebody who was making the show but for me as well because people are so in love with this music mm -hmm. from the old franchises in both trek and batman and whatever else you take on it has such a legacy so it's always it's frightening um when matt reeves posted the main title on 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 x a couple of days before the show launched i was I was horrified to, to read the comments because I was like, oh my God, they're going to expect some kind of Elfman theme and they're not getting that at all. And they're going to they're gonna go crazy. The pitchforks are coming out. But people were actually quite rece receptive of it. And they seem to instantly understand that we're going for a more darker, investigative, noir Batman than, than BTAS was, which was great to see that people actually caught on to that and accepted that as that version. So it was nice to see. Now, I would actually go a step further when you said it's the, the animated series is the best Batman cartoon. I would argue that's the best cartoon ever. <laughs> I, I think I, th I think you can actually make that leap and say it probably was the best cartoon ever. Fair enough. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't have gone this far, but it, I I absolutely accept that that it can be. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and, and and I think uh, as far as like Elfman, when you think about the animated Batman animated series, there's, a, there's that the famous dun, 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 and then, then that little like was it is that a gong or a cymbal that gets hit? I, I, that, yeah, that I think it's like a church church bell and a symbol together or something. Yeah. I have to listen I, again to. I yeah. could have sworn I heard something similar to that in one of your songs. Is that correct, or am I wrong on that? Yeah, well, I think that instrument is um, the church bells is called tub tubular bells. It's an orchestral percussion instrument that is not used a whole lot these days, but was very dominant back then in the '40s and '50s in the orchestral scores. So it's just it's just one of those things that puts us more into this time period alongside several other orchestration techniques, just to get specific for a moment, but um, um, playing string instruments like a violin or a cello or a viola outside its natural register. For example, playing a cello or violas in the very high register and putting a mute on the, on the strings, which is a technique that they use to play, that is the Bernard Herrmann sound that you can get when you do that. And it's a very technical thing, but instantly sounds different than when just regular violins are playing that exact same line. You don't get that same sonic resonance that you need. And also there's a, an enormous amount of use of low woodwinds, like contrabassoons and bass clarinets for suspense that we don't really do that much in today's scoring either, which is a quintessential tool that they used back then in these old scores. So all those things I kind of picked up on and sprinkled them throughout what I was doing just to keep that, that mood alive and that, uh, that time period present in the music that I was writing. So for someone who's not um, well versed in music like you are, what does it mean a mute on the strings? I never heard, I never heard that before. So a mute on the strings is a little plastic piece, you know? So if you imagine a violin, right, there's the strings and then there's the body and then the strings go up over like this thing called a bridge and then back down. Have you seen that little, yeah. it's that little wooden piece. Yeah. So that mute goes, gets stuck onto that bridge and then the sound, the, the sound becomes more muted. Oh, okay. Instead, so instead of having this very present, clear, harsh sound, it becomes very muted, almost as if you put a little high cut filter on it. Okay. Okay. And then if you if you do that with the whole group, it's an amazing sound. Oh, all right. That is also like I said. Uh, back when, when I was much younger, I used to play the violin, so I was familiar with, but I never heard of yeah. a mute on the strings. That's, that's there you awesome go. Phrase. <laughs> yeah, it's, awesome. a, it's something you can you can do that on the whole string section except for the basses, and it becomes this very soft sound. You do, you do it a lot when you play very soft cues. Hmm. Um, sort of emotional ones where you maybe have a piano playing the melody so that the strings are more muted and in the background rather than too present. So it's a nice way to do that. But in our case, we used it actually as a, as a tool to get that sound, like put the mute on, but play a forte, like play strong. <laughs> and then oh. you get a really interesting, an interesting sound. Oh, that is awesome. I like that. I never heard that before. Um, so when you're thinking about the score and the individual um, pieces throughout the, um, the show, um, are you viewing it as individual moments of the of the show, or are you viewing it from that all of it is almost from Batman's perspective? That he's kind of it's all from his perspective moving forward. Um, how did you approach your angle when you're discussing the particular pieces throughout? 
So it's very linear because I almost treat every episode as a mini movie, you know? So once we set up episode one, I had my, the basic themes that I needed to reoccur in every episode kind of figured out. There is a theme for Montoya. There's a theme for Barbara Gordon. There is a theme for Batman and sort of his relationship with Alfred, which is basically the Batman theme, but more sweeter as their relationship grows into something bigger. And, um, and those are the ones that are present, I think, throughout the whole 10 episodes, because these characters are re reoccurring and they are starting to work together as a team. And then every episode presented a, a new challenge for a new villain, because every episode features another villain. And I think one of the most exciting things for a composer working on anything Batman related is to score the villains, because there's, mm. there's so many of them and they have, you know, just like just like Batman, they have been interpreted musically by other composers over the years for, you know, so many times, you know, joke, the Joker by Hans and by, um, by the composers back for BTAS, Shirley Walker and, and her crew. And it's really fun to reinvent them every time because they're so messed up, <laughs> dark. And, you know, thankfully, in our case, we had, we had the gloves off a little bit on, on making it to, um, juvenile or child friendly because we're streaming we don't have to follow any tv channel protocols so i think the creators were a little bit more loose on how dark and scary it can get and i mean just in episode one there's a very particular death that shocked me when i saw the episode first i was like holy crap this is dark jesus mm. the penguin i'm sure you've seen it at this yep. point but yeah so and so for me it's just an amazing opportunity to like get under these get under the hood of these characters. You know, I think one of my favorite ones was Catwoman. Mm. I was in my studio trying to figure out like, what can I make that feels like a meowing instrument? So I had my violin out and I was, I'm, I played too a while back and I was messing around with these phrases that went like meow, meow, like with a slight bend. And then I, then I thought, okay, wait, what if that's by, played by a whole orchestra rather than just one instrument? And I went to, um, to Macedonia my go-to orchestra in Eastern Europe. And we just did a, an experiment session for like two hours, just messing around with that idea and see what we can come up with sort of to make a string orchestra sound like a cat. And it came out really cool. So I, I took that to James and Bruce and they were like, yeah, this is awesome. So we, we ran with it and that became the Catwoman theme. And I'm very proud of it because it's, it's a little sexy. It's got, mm. it's got some darkness. It's got a little bit of the thief heist thing incorporated as well but it does sound like a cat without being silly so i was very i was very proud of that one another one of my favorites was the firebug theme because he's so he's so childlike and and seemingly innocent when we meet him for the first time and he's you know he's this short kid person who's talking about this fire as if it's this most amazing thing in his life and so to get this sort of um innocence of his character we i built this this uh, creepy children choir that kind of accompanied him and it was super creepy, but it came out really well as well. I was very happy with that one. Yeah, and that, and that really applies to all of them. I can go through all of them if you want, but that they, every villain had its own concept and theme that was then threaded throughout each episode. So in terms of how I approach it, it's really every episode has its own little mini story and it, it was, I score it linearly. I start in the beginning and to the end. And I guess if you're looking at it that way, it is kind of Batman's POV because I am starting from finish to the end and I'm, I'm treating it as if I don't know everything, kind of like Batman does in the beginning of each episode. Mm. And in the end we do. So I suppose on a subconscious level, I am doing it from Batman's POV, but um, I'm more focused on just the arch of the story and all the acts and making sure that everything pays off the way it needs to be and that the themes are in the right places all throughout to give it the shape that it needs. Now, the Catwoman piece you're talking about, is, is that a Bad Bad Kitty? Is that the one you're referring to with the- On the soundtrack? Yeah. Uh, I have to see what I named it. It sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, cause that's what I was thinking, cause I was thinking about Bad Bad Kitty, and I think it's, um, and I was thinking that it only goes to Catwoman, but there's such a wonderful like whimsy to the beginning of it, and then you kind of, as it develops, it has a, like that kind of like daring action, like daredevil thing to it. Yeah, it's kind of like also like a sad as I thought it was a very um, brilliant piece. I really enjoyed that one. Thank you. Yes, it's, I thought it was it was a really cool one, too. It's got a little bit of, a, of the heist and you feel the fact that she's a thief, but she's not really um, a super, super bad guy because Batman mm. does have kind of she, he's attracted to her, obviously. 
you know. So there's that part of it. So it has to have a little bit of a seductive quality. So yeah, it's cool. And it is, I think it is Bad Bad Kitty. You're right. And, and, and what I was thinking about it is, was he talking about perspective? I was wondering if when you were scoring it, was it, is that Catwoman's perspective of who she is or is that Batman's perspective of who Catwoman is when you're developing that theme? I think it's our perspective, the audience. Mm -hmm. Because okay. we need to understand who she is. I'm not sure she sees herself as a bad guy, really. She's mm -hmm. kind of, an, you know, she's self-righteously stealing stuff because she needs to. She needs to pay for the bills and she owes money to her housekeeper. And it's, it's just how much she has to do. I think villains always have a very different perspective on themselves as opposed to mm -hmm. what we see. You know, they don't necessarily see themselves as bad at all. They always justify what their actions by something. Either it's a traumatic event in, in their life or their situation or I don't know what it is, but I think it's more the audience POV and for us to introduce her, like this is who she is. Like I said, I think it was a brilliant piece. Another piece I really liked a lot was uh, Fire in His Eyes, which I which was a great piece. And I kind of felt like um, it, that's the one that I kind of heard a little bit of the Batman animated series um, theme into it. Like there's a, the moment, I can't remember how deep into the um, piece it was, but I can definitely hear a little bit of the, you know, the dun, 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 and then like the, that little like, you said that bell gong thing. And I, I could, that's the one I kind of I, I kind of felt it um, at least um, the most was in was in that one piece. Yeah, and that's the one with the creepy children choir. I think. I think so. I think so. Yeah, so you can hear the la la la, and it was a very simple tune, almost like something a child can come up with, you know, or sing. So it's almost like he's humming it himself. It's like spraying fire, killing people, like going la la la. It's <laughs> super creepy. <laughs> and, and like that, and, and those, the idea when you're well, so thinking again about Batman, and it's that is the beginning of his career, he's not quite a superhero yet. In your opinion, when you're thinking about a theme for Batman, then at that moment, what is he? Because you said he's not a superhero yet. He, is he simply just a vigilante at that point? Is he 100% what you would call like the good guy at that moment? Or is there something else about him that the because a lot of times he's also portrayed as being a little bit obsessive, almost like deranged. So sort of sometimes when you're scoring that early part of Batman. What was the element of him that you felt um, best encapsulated that character at that moment in time? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I came into the show like, all right, let's do a Batman show. So the first scene I scored, Batman shows up. I'm going, ba, 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 or, you know, doing something with French horns or something. And yeah. then the instant response was, no, 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 no. He's not, that's not who he is yet. Let's take all that out. We're going to re, we're going to re, redesign this. We want people to feel like he's a menace and he's he's off kilter. He's he's an obscure character. Nobody really understands, and the fact that nobody understands him scares people mm -hmm. and almost make him really menacing. And I think one one scene where I kind of figure that out for the first time is when he grabs that guy who comes drunken out of the bar and he slingshots them up on the rooftop and then holds him on the train set. This is, I believe, in episode one, when he wants information about the penguin. There is nothing fanfaric or feel good about this. It's just madness. The score is just, you know, brutal and dissonant. And I think that's kind of the Batman we want to play. It's like he's just out there doing his thing. And we're not sure if he's actually helping or what's going on because he's, you know, he's He's brutal. He's mean, and he's running people over with his car, and they're falling, and they're probably dead. I don't know. Maybe they're not, but it's he's he's violent. And then we find out, you know, his backstory, which we're all all too, all too familiar with. Um, but you see that little kid in the doorframe becoming Batman right at that moment in this vulnerable, childlike state, and he's telling Alfred, "I'm gonna do this now for the rest of my life." <laughs> You know, it's a poignant moment, but at the same time, it's kind of creepy and scary. It's like, wow, well, how, how messed up is this kid that this is what he's going to do? <laughs> no, this, so I think that's kind of the angle. It's like, it's, it's disturbing. It's scary. But mm. yeah, as we go through the episodes, you, we, we grow to like him and we grow to, to understand his motivation. And we also see the goodness in him that he has, obviously. Also with the alliance as he forms with Montoya and Barbara, because those are the only ones that are also having their heart in the right place. You know, they're not a corrupt lawyer on, or a corrupt police in the in the pockets of the mob. And I think I think the music does evolve with those relationships and make him more of a friendly um, good guy as the episodes proceed, but not right away. We're taking our time to get there. And I think that's a really cool way to develop this because, you know, 
yes, we all know Batman, but what if we didn't? Like, what if he was just like, I mean, imagine somebody would say, there's a guy in a cape in LA yanking people in the alleys and then leaving them strung upside down. We'd be, we'd be freaked out. Like, who is this guy? What the hell? Nobody would be excited. And then that's kind of the idea behind it is to treat him that way musically as well. Now, I think my favorite piece in your entire score, um, I think it's my favorite piece. I think it's, it's, I'm going to go with this my favorite piece, um, is Harvey's Descent. I, I, okay. think, I think that's my favorite piece because um, I, I think my favorite, especially the opening. So we about that opening with, I think it's like a snare drum. Is in the, I think it's like Trump. It's like right at that beginning. It, it's so it's so well done. And then how it like builds. Um, they're like, I, maybe the right, I think the right phrase is scales down from the, yes. how like the upbeat. Deteriorates. Goes, yeah. <laughs> De from, devolves. From, from forward. It, it was brilliant. And how, can you just kind of walk me through that construction of that song from that opening, like the trumpet, snare drum, everything, like a, almost like a, um, a celebration to what yeah. it evolves into? Well, this is a scene, I can't recall which episode, but this is the scene that opens the episode where Harvey Dent is mayor and he is talking to an audience and he's proclaiming his, his victory and he's proclaiming what he's going to do as mayor. And the crowd is roaring, taking pictures. He's at the top of his game. And then... The music follows that 100 percent we were we're with that moment we we think he's made it you know for a minute um that's why it's so regal and almost presidential mm -hmm. that's kind of that's kind of the idea like it had to be very presidential and official but then as we realize we're actually in a really really awful dream everything just gets bent down and detuned and the strings kind of slide and everything gets out of whack and you kind of realize halfway through when when, when people understand who they're looking at and you see the face and they start, I think, do they, do they start laughing or take pictures of him? It's, anyway, they react to his grotesqueness on the scene and then he wakes up all in sweat in his apartment and you see he's absolutely on rock bottom. Mm. It's, an, it's an interesting, like, short, fast forward summary of what had become of him, you know, because in the beginning he was a successful sleazy lawyer uh, playing as if he's on top of everybody and controls everything and, you know, trying to get people to endorse him left and right, going above and beyond to really make sure he stays on the ticket, even getting involved with the mob. So he's, you know, he's gone through all these stages and it hasn't worked out for him. And he ended up the way he did. Now, and yeah, the part with um, the, the snare drum part, at least as you said, um, yeah. the presidential is, is almost heroic. Again, yeah. that is his view of himself at the beginning. Like, does he, in your opinion, when you're thinking about Harvey Dent, because he, unlike, unlike um, Batman: The Dark Knight film, um, where it's clear that Harvey Dent is a, a heroic figure at some point, at least on some level, he's very heroic. Yes. Animated uh, Batman: Kid Crusader, he doesn't seem like he's at any point really heroic, but does, but in your opinion, does he view himself then? though as a very heroic individual basically i think he wants to be yeah he absolutely wants to be i think he knows deep down he's a little rotten and that's why he's uh, so sleazy and that's why he he can't help but uh be in cahoots with the mob that eventually promises him the victory hmm. i think on a level he knows he's 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 corrupt but i think he, deep down he really wants to be the hero he wants to be cherished by the people and he wants to be in, you know, absurdly in a power position, which again is not really a, a noble trait, wanting to have power, but that's what he wants. But he probably wanted to be a noble figure. He wanted to have that nobility and that goodness to the outside, which clearly he didn't. I, but there's a there's one moment where he's in court and he has the opportunity to to do what he was told by the mob. And honestly, I thought he's going to do that because he's been presenting himself so easily corruptible this entire time. And then he chooses not to, which then ends up costing him everything. Mm. But there is a little bit of a goodness in him that comes out in that particular moment that makes you realize there was something in him that could have potentially been good and maybe would have created a good leader, but it wasn't enough. And I think that's what I love about the, the Cape Crusader series is that Especially for a cartoon, they do present some very complex characters. Yeah. And as a composer, you have to present some very complex pieces to represent these very complex characters. And it, it must have been quite a challenge to equal the complexity of what they show on the cartoon with the music attached to it. Yeah, 
Absolutely. They're, they're really complex. I mean, Batman alone, like we've already talked about, you know, treating him more, more obscure and scary and more, more the investigator and the detective rather than a superhero. It's a very cool take on him. And you know, I was really excited to, to, to approach it that way. And, um, you know, Harley Quinn, too, she's really scary. But at the same time, she also has kind of good motivations. So this, that's the complexity in villains that I really am a big sucker for. If you actually start to like them and start to identify for them and want them to succeed mm. more than more than lose, I think that's when things get really interesting. Now, was um, there already yeah. discussions of a season two and or at least musically what you may do in a season two or were there no discussions yet about a second season? Okay, so Bruce Tim is working on scripts for season two. Okay. So there looks like there will be one, but I don't, I, I don't know anything about it in terms of specifics. Um, they haven't really told me anything what they're going to do next. So I'm, I'm in the dark as you are, but I know there's going to be something to continue this beautiful project. So hopefully I have no doubt that's going to be just as awesome or better than what we've already done. Is it already um, official that you'll be the composer for season two? Uh, you know, I, I always say it's official when I finish. <laughs> <laughs> so let's leave it at that. Thank you, Paul. I hope to be. <laughs> so uh, where can our listeners find the score to Batman Cape Crusader and what's next for you? Cape Crusader is everywhere on every big music streaming platform, Apple Music, Spotify, Pandora. Um, I don't know what else there is out there now. I, I only use Apple Music, so I don't bother finding the others. But I know that Water Tower Records is putting it out there as wide as they can. So it should not be easy to find. It's even on YouTube, every single queue. Mm -hmm. You may have to watch an ad before, but it's out there. They, they put it up there too. So easy to find. And what's next for me is uh, Dragon Prince Season 7 coming out sometime soon. I'm not sure when, but we just launched Season 6. So fans are excited for 7, which should conclude the saga. That's for Netflix. And then I have a nice movie coming out. And on October 4th, if you're into things like Stranger Things and The Goonies, it's sort of a oh. marriage between those two. Uh, period piece with kids on bikes trying to solve a mystery in their town. And it's, it's a sweet movie. Very, very good movie. It's one of those rare genres where it's a spooky film, but you can watch it with the whole family, which I okay. love because I have kids that age and I can never go see scary movies with them because they're always too, you know, <laughs> nightmare inducing. So this is a good one and it comes out, you know, during the Halloween month. So if you have little kids, um, it's a good one to watch. It's a really, really good, good What's film. What's the name? Are you able to say the title? It's called Monster Summer. Monster Summer. Oh, very cool. Monster Summer, directed by uh, a former child actor, David Henry, who took amazing care of this project. So oh, very it's, a very, cool. it's a beautiful movie. The trailer is out on YouTube. You guys can watch it. Um, if you, 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 and you'll see if you're into that kind of stuff, but it's a, it's a nice period piece. If you like the Goonies and Stranger Things, this one's definitely for you. Oh, very cool. Um, like I said, uh, when you're ready to talk about it, please come back. You've been an absolute pleasure to talk with, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Have a great night, sir. You too. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Virgin Stars podcast. Please help me battle the algorithms by liking and subscribing. Please turn for the next episode when David Avalon boards the mothership to discuss drawing blood from Image Comics. To the next voyage, travel on.